Homegrown alligator, see you later. Gotta hit the road, gotta hit the road. Sun change in the atmosphere, architecture unfamiliar. I can get used to this. Time flies by in the yellow and green. Stick around and you'll see what I mean. There's a mountain top that I'm dreaming of. If you need me, you know where I'll be. I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like a someone. I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like a someone. South of the equator, navigator, gotta hit the road, gotta hit the road. Deep sea diving round the clock, bikini bottoms, lager tops, I can get used to this. Time flies by in the yellow and green, stick around and you'll see what I mean. There's a mountain top that I'm dreaming of, if you need me you know where I'll be. I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like a someone. I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like a someone. We got two in the front, two in the back, sailing along, and we don't look back, 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 back. By in the yellow and green, stick around and you'll see what I mean. There's a mountain top that I'm dreaming of. If you need me, you know where I'll be. Underneath the hot sun, feeling like a someone. I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like a someone. I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like a someone. I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun, feeling like a someone, someone, someone. I'll be riding shotgun underneath the hot sun. All right, welcome to any newcomers. Um, guys, this next song was chosen to remind you in when everything starts to feel overwhelming, you need to remember to tune out all the chaos and focus on what you're working very hard to achieve in this very mad world that we live in. Every 
childhood Sit and listen, sit and listen Went to school and I was very nervous No one knew me, no one knew me Hello teacher, tell me what's my lesson Look right through me, look right through me and I hope you enjoy the seminar today. Right. I hope you all enjoyed the lovely music of Jaron Fosteris. He is a local Westfall Boy High School old boy and one of the lead singers for the Barnyard and a personal friend of Prof Delia North, who is our host uh, this afternoon. Uh, so it's nice to know Westfall Boys High School. Not only are you good at maths, you're also good at singing. My name is Sally Frost and I'm the public relations manager for the college and am your technical host for this afternoon. We'd like to welcome you to our Dudes in Data event. It is online because of COVID restrictions, but we're not going to let that stop us. And we look forward to a, a fun and educational and instructive afternoon. A special welcome to our guests who are Zooming in from overseas. Thank you for joining us. Okay, that's it from me. I'd like to hand over to Professor Delia North, who's Dean and Head of School of the School of Math, Stats and Computer Science. She has been in the education game for over 30 years and is well respected nationally and internationally in the field of statistics. And you will soon learn, if you haven't learned already, that data science is her passion. So Delia, over to you. Thank you very much, Sally, for introducing me. And I hope you've enjoyed the entertainment from Jaron. It's now my absolute pleasure to welcome our distinguished guests, speakers, teachers, as well as our VRPs of today, of course, the learners. This is the first ever Dudes in Data held at UKZN, and we're very excited to be with you. As you know, you must probably have heard about the Women in Analytics event that we had last week, on last Friday, in fact, an exact week ago. And this movement, Women in Data Science, Women in Analytics, actually started at the University of Stanford in 2015, and five years later has become a global phenomenon, simply because of the underrepresentation of women in the field of data science. However, it's not just about women. There are too few data scientists. We need both men and women, and particularly in developing countries, there's such a shortage of data scientists. It's a new field, and we'll be focusing on that today. So that is why at UKZN, we've shown that we're extremely serious about growing our data scientists. In these two, um, if you look at these two logos that we have created, you, the woman in analytics, as well as the dudes in data. And we've trademarked it. You might notice a little TM at the bottom here, because this is going to be an ongoing thing at UKZN, that we're going to have many events to encourage, to advocate for more learners to go into the fields of data science. We work very closely, the data science sector works very closely with industry to ensure that the programs that we have, the various degrees, speak to the needs of industry. And that is um, not only because we want uh, to have more graduates in data science, but we work collaboratively in general 
to increase awareness of job opportunities in data science with our industry partners who have assisted us by sponsoring us in this event. So I'd like to thank them as well. Now, when I thought about the virtual event, which is quite different, as I say, this is the first ever Dudes in Data, but we have done Women in Analytics, which is also for grade 11 uh, best performing students, but learners, but it was aimed at the ladies. So this is the first time we're doing an event for boys. And I spent quite a bit of time trying to think what would be the type of program I should have to encourage boys to think about data science as their career choice. And I thought there'd be nothing more powerful than getting a few postgrad recent or current postgrad students talking about why they study data science, how they experience it, or maybe even the experience in the workplace. So you'll be hearing from our postgrad students uh, as we go through the program. Also, I think it's really important to have an understanding of the span of diversity of careers if you, if you study data science and the opportunities in the workplace. And then I think it's important for learners to feel the excitement of revealing a story within data. With other words, if you're looking at masses of data, you're trying to find patterns and connections between variables. For you maybe today to have the opportunity to partake in a game or a data activity where you can reveal a story within the data, I think that would be quite powerful. So that is everything that we've planned for you for today. And I hope you enjoy the exercise that we've done. So now thinking about a future career, and I'm not just here to say do data science. I just want to give you some food for thought, no matter what you end up doing. If you think about where you are in your life right now, I want to take you back to the first day when you started what we call big school, right? You were most probably about six years old and you started in grade one after having done grade R. Imagine from that first day of grade one up to where you are now, how much growth has taken place in the 11 years from your grade one first day to now at the end of grade 11. Imagine the growth. Now I can tell you that pales in comparison with the growth that will take place in the first 11 years of your career if you study what is right for you. So the question immediately arises, how will I know what's right for me? If you think about it right until now, what are the choices you've made at school? All you've done is decided whether to do mathematics or mathematical literacy. And you know, I'm sure everybody here is a top, one of the top five in your grade, in your school. There was absolutely, it was a no brainer and you decided to do mathematics and not mathematical literacy. So that's your single big choice you've made. And now you've got to decide what to study for a whole career going forward. And that's going to be a pretty long time. So you want to be sure to choose what is right for you. So let's talk a little bit about that. There are lots of traditional paths, and I think you all know them. You're very smart, and you can most probably become a doctor, engineer, a lawyer. You're most probably good at everything if you're one of the top five in your, in your grade, in your school, in grade 11. So there's so many opportunities, and so many people will give you advice. But they'll generally talk about the classic careers, and I've mentioned a few here. So um, there are lots of new careers. It was probably 10 years ago, nobody would speak about it, even five years ago, business intelligence analyst, big data engineer. I've highlighted a few. I'm not going to mention them all. But the new careers that the people advise you must probably haven't heard about. So there are whole new considerations. And the good news is that you don't have to make your mind up now. You can delay what you want to study. Also, you must think about the unemployment rate. You can see in South Africa, the unemployment rate is pretty high for all citizens. It's scarily high for youth. But what worries me the most, is almost a third of our graduates are unemployed. And this is recently released from our National Statistics Office, that's in South Africa. So imagine what it must feel like to be well-educated but not have a job. It can't be much fun. So this persistently high youth unemployment really is a problem for the country, but also for you as an individual. So you need to pick a potential career path where the job market is strong and likely to remain strong going forward. 
But remember what I said in the first hint, you must have versatility beyond your starting point. I actually don't think I said that. I think that's part of the screen freeze I had. So you must stick hint one, the second one here, pick a point that gives you a starting point that doesn't lock you in because you're not sure at grade 11 or grade 12 or first year university what you want to do for the rest of your life. You might think you know, but you're very likely to change your mind. I certainly did, and most students I work with change their mind as they go along. So I would encourage you to pick a starting point where you're likely to have a good potential for a future job market, but then to have versatility. And you'll see what I mean by that. In years gone by, UKZN had an actuarial science program, which you can see I've put the, um, the courses that you did for the BSc actuarial science. You can see it involved, the circle, you did two years of mathematics, three years of statistics, a little bit of computer science, and then a whole lot of finance, um, economics, and these courses were actually financial reporting, which is a kind of accounting as well, and then some investment science. And then as the years gone by, went by, the university closed actuarial science, and we've started a BSc data science, which has got a big overlap with the old actuarial science, but where the commerce flavored and investment sciences were removed, with a whole lot of computer science added. That's precisely because we're in the data age, the fourth industrial revolution, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about. So this is our degree that we feel at the moment is going to give you a lot of job opportunities. And this is precisely the plan if you study the BSc um, data science. You, what you're doing is the yellow, Three years, you can see this is year one, year two, year three, semester one, semester two, and so on. So you end up the yellows, you do three years of computer science, you do three years of statistics, and then you do mathematics for two years. So when you come, if you make this your versatile starting point, you can imagine that you have to be quite good at mathematics. You're good at mathematics at school. So you might say, well, let me start here. I'm going to do a lot of computer science, a lot of mathematics, a lot of statistics up to second year, and then I'll decide. But what you need to notice is that there's optional 16 credits. What it means is that you can decide what you want to do here. You might choose chemistry. You love chemistry. You might choose physics. Then at the end of first year, if you want to be a computer scientist, you've done the right computer science to carry on, and you can drop statistics and chemistry if chemistry is your extra. So this is the same starting point if you want to be a computer scientist. It's the same starting point if you want to be a mathematician. Whether it's a pure mathematician, applied mathematician, this is the same first year mathematics. It's the same statistics if you want to major in statistics only and something else. You could put chemistry here and then you end up in second year doing a lot more chemistry and you don't end up doing this second year in this precise third year. So this first year is a really good starting point for somebody good in mathematics because it gives you the right mathematics to major in pure applied mathematics, but also computer science assumes no knowledge from school. It starts from scratch. Statistics assumes no knowledge from school. We start from scratch. So strong at mathematics, you start with this combination and it gives you versatility but also starting from scratch in the two disciplines that you must probably don't know and can decide at the end of first year whether you want to continue with these two, combined with maths and carry on with a whole data science or in second year you can opt out, et cetera. So there's so many opportunities and that's why I think it's a really good starting point is the data science degree. It gives you versatility and you've got lots of different opportunities. You can even become a physicist or a chemist by taking that option there. Or you can do a whole combination right up to third year and end up being a data scientist. So what I want to say is choose wisely, start with a versatile point, choose, uh, choose very wisely, feel in your heart what you enjoy. Because after all, the rest of your life is a long time to do something that you don't enjoy. So as you go along, you'll feel what is right for you. You need to believe in your choice. And if you really find you're not enjoying it, make a change. But whatever you choose, I would encourage you to include some data training, some statistics, even if it's just one or two modules, every area. 
will need statistics, will need some statistics knowledge because we're in the age, the data age. You've heard about fourth industrial revolution and in days gone by, people, maybe in your parents or your teachers era, statistics was thought of as horrible, horribility and sadistics. It was horrible, people didn't enjoy it. They were often as commerce students or even medical doctors forced to do statistics when they didn't enjoy it, but it was taught in a way in those days, which was more like the theory of statistics. So nowadays we do relevant data analytics training. We link our programs right from first year service courses. You're learning how to work with data, how to discover stories in data, which you'll be doing later on in the program. So this teaching of statistics has changed and I would encourage you to think about statistics courses. And then it's important to not limit yourself. I think there's only one way to success. If I do badly in this module, I'm a failure. It's not like that. There's so many paths to success. You might think there's a golden path and you've got to find this path, but it's not true. This probably looks something like this. For somebody else, this will be the red path. Your red path, you'll feel with your heart as you go along what you really enjoy. So I can encourage you to be positive, patient, persistent, you will be successful. And I want to encourage you, if you do think of data science as, an, as a career option, to come to UKZ Inc. This is Team UKZ in Statistics. We're ready and able to help you to become a data scientist. Hope you enjoy the rest of the program. And I now hand over to Mr. Dane Bax, who's our PhD student, to tell you about his career path, why he chose to do what he did and where he's ended up in the Isle of Man. But let me not take away from Dane's talk. Over to you. Thank you very much, Delia. Thank you for the warm introduction. Um, good afternoon, boys. Um, I hope you're enjoying the, the seminar so far. First of all, I'd like to, you guys all deserve a, a, a big pat on the back for being um, the best performers. <clears throat> so hats off to you. Very well done there. <clears throat> So a brief introduction to myself. Um, yeah, my name's Dane Bax. I work as a lead data scientist for an international online gaming company. Um, I manage a small team of data scientists. And I got into I got into data science. Um, well, I got into statistics through through work. Um, it's as Delia said, it's it's important to be able to to it's an important skill set to be able to analyze data and look at data. Um, and that naturally just, just came about in, in my job working as an analyst. Um, that then led into, well, taking a deeper dive into, into statistics um, and then starting my PhD with Delia and Temeskin. Um, and then, yeah, then I naturally moved into the world of data science. And data science is a, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, career path because of all the different different um, business problems that you get to solve. Things like building um, recommendation engines. So if you, if you use Netflix or um, uh, take a lot or Amazon and you get those, those recommend, uh, recommended items, well, that's actually machine learning algorithms under the hood, which data scientists build um, in order to, to improve the customer experience and, and make the company more money in the end. <clears throat> So we do a whole bunch of cool things like building recommendation engines for games. Uh, we, we predict the performance of a new game before it goes live. So it, it's, it's a combination of, of, of computer science, statistics, mathematics, um, and UKZN has been a huge, uh, huge enabler for me. Um, uh, the, the, the knowledge that, that uh, Prof Temeskin and Prof North have imparted on me through my, through my journey on my PhD has been immense. Um, and certainly it's, it's, it's helped open international doors. Um, data is the new currency. It's, it's, there's a huge shortage of, of, of people who can um, apply methods to data in order to, to derive value. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a shortage glo globally. So if you choose to, to become a data scientist, you will not only work on interesting problems, you will you'll never be um, You'll never be without a job. You'll, you'll always be in demand. Um, yeah, and it's an exceptionally, exceptionally rewarding career. Um, yeah, I've, it's managed to get me over here. It's the Isle of Man. Um, it can pretty much get you anywhere in the world. So I would really consider a career in data science. And if you're going to go 
down that route, I would strongly, strongly recommend that uh, you, you, you do it with Prof North and uh, Prof uh, Tmeskin um, at uh, UKZM, because they, they have one of the best, if not the best program um, in the country. So yeah, I hope, I hope to see, I hope to see all of you, uh, well, around campus someday when I'm there visiting. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's been it's been lovely, lovely chatting to you all. I'll now hand over to to Maurice. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words in the dudes and data. Um, I'd like to introduce myself, Maurice Chauke. I am working for Mondi, based in Hilton, in Peter Maurice Beck. And what uh, Prof Noss said about me in the invitation is pretty much all you need to know about me for now. Uh, in the next couple of minutes, I share with you why I chose a uh, career in statistics, uh, what I find inspiring about statistics, uh, what are the challenges of uh, being a statistician, and um, what will my advice be to a young man who is considering a career in statistics or data science? And uh, finally, I'll answer the most important question. Would I recommend the statistics department at the University of KwaZulu-Natal? Um, now, without wasting time, why I chose a career in statistics? The perfect answer would be because I enjoy ans uh, providing answers to real life problems uh, using evidence from data. But that is a perfect answer because that is where I am now. It is not where I started. I started as a mathematics student. And uh, being a mathematics student, I thought it would be cool to do statistics. Uh, after registering or after doing few courses in uh, statistics and interact, uh, interacting with uh, different lecturers there, I realized that statistics is just mathematics with application to real life problems. Call it mathematics with flavor, if you like. And that was, without a doubt, appealing to me. Now, what do I find inspiring about statistics? Now, as a, at some point as a statistician, you realize that you have the ability to interrogate the data. And when you interrogate data, they start giving you information. This is the interesting part. When you start communicating that information from the data, the world pays attention. And you cannot tell me that it doesn't feel good when the world pays attention to you. Now, what are the challenges of being a statistician? Now, because being a statistician makes you so versatile, you end up uh, being this hot property that everybody wants a piece of, and you can only be at one place at a given time. So now choosing, the headache of choosing who to serve at any given time is nice. Uh, sometimes it's even nicer. Did I say it's a challenge? No, maybe I'm bragging. You choose what works. Okay. What would I advise a young man who is considering a career in statistics or data science. I'll say just do it. You will not regret it. The good thing about, about uh, statistics or data science is that wherever you end up, if you choose, you are not happy. You do not need to go back to the university to redefine your career path. All you need to do is move from where you are to where you feel you'll be most comfortable because you'll be versatile enough to survive just about anywhere, be it in finance, be it in agriculture, I can mention all the fields, but you know, it will need uh, not 10 minutes, we'll need a couple of days to actually mention all the fields where you would fit. Would I recommend the statistics department at the University of Brazil at all? Without a doubt, yes. I like the people, I like the atmosphere there. I can tell you that the lecturers are not only interested in getting you to have a degree in statistics, they're actually interested in what you'd like to do in life. So they shape, they help you to shape your career accordingly. It is, a no, it, it is no surprise that 10 years after leaving the university, I am back registered for a PhD. And um, the, uh, you, you may ask the question, did I explore or compare the statistics department at the University of Brazil Natal with other universities? The answer is no. If you're happy where you are, you waste no time trying to compare or explore, but rather you do the most uh, with the current environment that you are happy with. And I can tell you that even after finishing my PhD, I'll find another way 
to connect my to keep myself connected with the statistics department. And if you're sitting there as a statistics lecturer or a part of the staff, good luck trying to get rid of me. I am actually here to stay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dane and Maurice, two of our very successful postgrad students. Let me promise you, I had we have no idea what they were going to say. <laughs> It looks like we paid you guys to make such good stories about us, but thank you very much for that. Boys, I've now got a real treat in store for you. We have Professor John Baylor, the president of the most prestigious statistics body in the world, who will be interviewed by our students. Prof Baylor received a PhD in statistics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and is now a distinguished professor in statistics at Miami University in the USA. He runs a Stats and Stories project where podcasts are made of interviews to reveal the statistics behind the, the, statistics behind the stories and the stories behind the statistics. Prof Baylor is going to give you boys, grade 11 boys, most likely have never had exposure to data science the opportunity to interview him. I'm really looking forward to that. But before I hand over to Prof Baylor, I must just confess that I've got one boy in the audience who's not a grade 11 school boy, who I've asked to be on the interview panel for Prof John Baylor, and that is Aaron Nadu. I'm sure you've all seen the many articles that have appeared about Aaron in the social media. The top matriculant of 2019 is doing our current data science first year. And we're really very privileged to have Aaron in our class. So I'm now going to open the floor to Prof Baylor, and then Aaron will ask him the first question, the first burning question you have. And after that, it's over to grade 11 boys. Uh, thank you. Um, well, Professor North, is, <clears throat> it is such a, a the pleasure and a delight to be here. I, I, uh, I only wish I could be joining you physically, but I am honored and and just truly delighted to be here. And I'm I'm scared of what the boys are going to ask me. I'm I'm sure they're going to be some of the toughest examiners that I've ever faced. So so Aaron, what 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 would you like to start talking about? Good afternoon, Prof. Uh, I just wanted to ask you what made you decide to go into statistics. <clears throat> wow. So when I started out, I I really liked math. In science, when I was a when I was a student before university, but when I went to university, I was pre med. I thought I wanted to be a physician. And I think when I was when I was starting, one of the things that I, I realized is I was taking some of the the, bio, the science classes that I was I really liked the the foundations, the mathematical and statistical foundations to the work much more than I liked the laboratory components. So for me, I was sort I was attracted to how do you frame the problems mathematically and statistically. And, and then after when I was in, in my university studies, I took a regression class. I don't know, Aaron, have you had a regression class? Yeah, we've done some of that. Yeah. I for me, that was almost to me, it felt like almost magic because I was taking what I could observe to predict what I couldn't. And I, I that was that was kind of the point where I went. Wow, this is these are amazing ideas, and and I like the idea that it, it could be applied in any context. So I think that's what really drew, that was what attracted me to this as a as a career path. How about you? What attracted you? Well, I've always loved maths. I've been doing maths Olympiads since I was in primary school. I've gone overseas to represent South Africa in international maths Olympiads. And more recently, I've also enjoyed computer programming. Uh -huh. I've also represented South Africa in an international mathematics Olympiad. So those two aspects, maths and computer science, I've always really enjoyed. And statistics feels like, uh, and data science as well, feels like a good way of combining maths with computer science to solve problems about the world. Yeah, have you done any simulations? Uh, I've done a few on my own, nothing too major, but yeah. That was, a, that was one of the ways that I really started enjoying the use of computing as a tool with my statistical and mathematical training and education. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I, <clears throat> I think Aaron, you and I are a lot alike. I mean, we're doing the same kind of stuff and, and attracted to the same types of ideas. Thank you for, for starting the, the conversation rolling. Thank you. Prof, I'd like to ask another question, if I may. Please. Um, well, 
data science is often billed as the intersection of statistics and computer science. So I wanted to ask how important you think computer skills and computer programming skills are for a statistician in this modern world? And that's a really good question, Aaron. Um, the, I, I, I often think of this in an analogy. Can, can you imagine being a chemist who doesn't know about instruments like a mass spectrometer or other way or a physicist? without understanding the instruments. I, I think if you're going to be someone who's doing modern statistics and, and data science, to not have competency in the use of the, the, the tools is just, uh, it's just not gonna work. I mean, you're not gonna be able to be effective. You're not gonna be valuable as an employee. Uh, I think you're gonna also find that, that you're going to continue in, to be learning about these computing tools because they evolve very quickly. I, I, I believe that, that uh, I'm, I'm losing your question here. I'm just sort of thinking about how I want to continue to respond. The, the question that you're asking is about the importance of it is I think it's, it's critical and key. Um, I, in the same way that I think that, that a computer scientist who's doing data science without thinking about statistics is missing an important part of the story because they're missing some of the ideas about how do you evaluate evidence? How do you detect signal and noise? How do you have representative samples? How do you, you know, sort of all the things that are yeah. key and, and core in statistics are appropriate. With computer science, I mean, one of the challenges will be that, that you need to understand how to, to code solutions, how to implement solutions. You'll, you, you may not understand everything about the storage of data that's, that's you know, kind of being placed in certain uh, databases and distributed in ways if it's gigantic, but, but you need to know enough to be able to at least collaborate with the computer scientists as you move forward. So I, so, so uh, yes, absolutely. And I, and looking at what uh, Professor North shared earlier about the, the way the program has evolved in terms of the majors, I mean, that type of enhancement of the computing skills to, to complement the statistical and math skills, I think is a, is a critical development. I think it's very smart on the part of the, the program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was a question from Mohammed Vada. He was asking about simulations. What simulations are you referring to? L let me ask a question just to the, the, the larger group. And, and, and uh, so, so would, if the students that are attending here, what kind of, can you just post in chat some of the, the classes that you've taken in statistics? Just post it for everybody. And I see Mohammed's question. So I want to, so Mohammed in particular, I'll ask you, what, what stack qu classes have you had so far? So probability and, okay. So you've had some probability, good. Um, when you've taken probability, you, you, you studied, one, one thing I might ask is, did, did you study about different distributions? Yes. Okay. So when you studied about different distributions, did you did you ever uh, talk about you know that that what a what a distribution would look like, say for I, I don't know a beta distribution or you know for for a random variable that was between zero and one, or did you talk about any of those types of various types of distributions as part of your studies? Or did you talk more about properties of distributions and properties of probability? So normal distribution, hypergeometric, binary, perfect. Okay, so so you know, um, uh, so let me let me prompt you with one more question. With when you talked about the binomial distribution, did you ever talk about how it looked like it? You know that a binomial distribution, when with certain probabilities, tended to look look more symmetric, like almost you'd have a normal approximation to it. Oh, okay. So I, I'll first make this as a statement that, that generally if you, there's often a normal approximation to the binomial, if you have probabilities close to, to about a half, if you got a binomial experiment with the probabilities close to a half and you have large number of trials or even with relatively small number of trials, if it's close to a half, how would you know that? Well, one of the ways that you may do it is a simulation is a computer experiment and it's a computer experiment where you would say, okay, suppose I were to sample from this distribution and I can sample according to some of the probability laws that govern that distribution. And when you sample from the, that distribution, what is it that you observe as a, you know, what does it look like and how would you then visualize it? So the, the computer simulation is allowing you to basically 
uh, create a world that's defined by a probability model that you then observe and then you look at properties of it. And that's so from a, pro from a probability course perspective, you could look at kind of shapes of probability distributions as you varied some character, some parameters of it. From a statistical inference perspective, you could study hypothesis tests to see if, you know, to study aspects of power. So you could simulate the properties of power, or you could simulate whether or not they maintain things like uh, the type one error rates of tests. So, so simulation is, an, is a strategy for exploring statistical properties of methods, particularly with smaller sample sizes. So I think that's about as, and, and you know, I, I will, uh, I'll certainly invite some of my other, my other colleagues that are here. So whether Professor North wants to jump in or uh, if Dane or Maurice would, would like to, to weigh in as well at the, in responding. Hi, hi John. Um, you know, we get a lot of information about COVID-19, coronavirus, infections and that sort of thing. And every time I see data going up and down and that sort of thing, I always think about statisticians. Can you tell us what is the role of a statistician in terms of predicting what is going to happen? 250,000 people are going to die in the, in the US in the next two months. Are they right? Are they wrong? Where, where, where do statisticians sit in these sort of predictions? Wow. Um, that's a... You know, th so uh, Albert, thanks for asking such an easy question. <laughs> uh, yeah, in, in terms of the role of statistics, I would say the role of statistics is as a collaborator. I mean, we should, there's, there's a role to be collaborating with epidemiologists and with uh, public health officials. And, and, you know, some of this is just, uh, you know, it's essentially s studying the, the, the process and the, the trajectory of an infectious disease. So if you're studying an infectious, the, the, there, have, you, have, have, have you ever, ever talked about like SIR models, these, these, these models that talk about that there's, there's essentially transition states where you go between kind of an uninfected to an infected to recovered, you know, so there, you're looking at kind of this trajectory. And there were predictions early on that there would almost be this sawtooth pattern of that there would be an increase of cases, then a decrease, then an increase, then a decrease. So, so statisticians are involved with with helping to take the data to collect that to you know think about how do you take the data that you would would collect to estimate parameters of these models to try to do projections of uh, what could happen into the future. Um, those are that's not an easy question. The other role that statisticians have, and and you know within Within any country, there could be a plan to think about how do you set up surveillance systems? How do you think about sampling? Who should you be sampling? What are some of the characteristics of the epidemic that you wish to be able to estimate? Uh, one, one question that you would think about, um, with, that you might think about estimating is there's, there is these kind of infectivity rates. It's, it's sometimes indicated by a parameter R. And in the case of these infectivity rates, that you know what what you would do is you would estimate uh, you, you're basically saying an infect an R of of one says that each infected person tends to infect one more. If your R is greater than one, you tend to have growth in the infected population. And one of the goals is to think about you know how do we drive the infectivity rates to be less than to be less than one so that it eventually will die out. That's that is a it's a statistical question of estimation, and it's a matter of how do you think about the data to support that. That's all. That's all statistical thinking, but it's not statistical thinking that that would be done in a in in the absence of good collaboration with public health scientists and epi, you know epidemiologists in particular. I you know I would also you, you would argue that that any kind of good applied work is going to be done in the context of of collaboration with those that really really know best. Does does that help respond? Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. And uh, by the way, I'll, I'll mention to you that there are some amazing, um, amazing data sets that are that are out there. And one of the things that we've been doing in, at my school is that is that it, as part of the assignments, we give them a um, I'm going to I'm going to post this in chat. And and we get, I've given my class an assignment and actually it's due today. Their their final projects are due in my class today. And they're producing a, they're, they're going to produce essentially a, 
a, a dashboard, a dynamic interactive dashboard where they're downloading data from the, the state where I live and they're looking at some of the properties of, of, these, of these data. Uh, in, in particular with respect to, to um, looking at what's happening in terms of COVID infectivity, hospitalization, death rates, and trying to look at it uh, for different, different counties within the, the you know, sort of sub-regions within our state. And I'll, I'll paste, just if you're interested, I'm just grabbing it for the chat. Uh, this is an example of one of the, the, the apps that we've been, uh, the web app that we've been working on to, to try to, to do this. Okay, so that's that's so you ask a really important question. I, I by the way, my my uh, my wife is a is a public health person. Uh, she's actually a commissioner of our local county. So I spend a lot of time talking to her about kind of what what things are happening and how that might go about. I'm I'm also my background. My PhD is in biostatistics, and I did a uh, a postdoc at one of the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. Uh, not not an infectious disease, but more an environmental kind of impact stuff. John, there was a, a question from James Hooper. Uh, he wanted to know what made you go the academic route and became a prof as opposed to leaping into the private world. With... Well, thanks for the question. So um, when, when the opportunities are, are brought in, and I'll tell you the, the one thing that I swore that I would never do when I was, uh, when I was in, before university as I swore I would never teach. That's a, my mom was an elementary school teacher and I said, I just don't want to be a teacher. So I decided I was going to be a, I was going to work in industry and that was my F, my, my goal. And in fact, when I was a university student, I did a, um, I did summer work at, at Procter and Gamble, you know, which is a consumer products company. And I was doing work in, with a stat consultant in that, in a division there. And then I was ultimately doing some work with a home performance testing market research group. So I went to graduate school thinking that I would go into industry. And then after I was in grad school, I, I decided I, I liked kind of applications in a context like a medical context. So I thought I was going to work uh, in government research at a, you know, at a, one of the National Institutes of Health. That's where, where kind of my passion was. But, but then I, I realized I was missing something. And what I was missing is I, I love, I love the, the kind of diversity of tasks that are part of, of work at a university. I enjoy my teaching. I enjoy my research. I enjoy my collaborations. I also liked the fact that there was a periodicity in my life at the university. So for me, part of the, the periodicity was that, you know, as I was doing my, as, as I was working on, you know, you know, my classes, I knew my classes were coming to an end. I, you know, I know that at the end of, at the end of this, um, this time that I'm going to be you know, at the end of this week, I'll be done with all my classes. And they're, you know, so that's, there's endings, but then there'll be new beginnings as the next term will start up. So I, I love, I love the autonomy. I can choose kind of tasks that I'm working on. I love the periodicity, the cycles of the academic life were, were there. And I, and I love the, the diversity of things that I've been able to do. So, and you know what, I think I would have been happy in other jobs too. I, I liked when I worked at, at the consumer products company. I, I really liked when I worked in government. I mean, I've enjoyed all of these jobs. And by the way, I've, I've continued to collaborate with people that are working in government for the last probably 30 plus years. I mean, so even though I've been in university, I have not stopped working with colleagues in business industry and government. So I get, I'm spoiled. I think I get to do the best of both worlds. Thanks, John. That was an interesting one. Uh, Luke is asking, he says that manipulation of data is something that's arisen as a problem, especially during COVID-19. And how do statisticians prevent data being represented in the wrong way? Wow. Um, I, I think that, you know, the one thing that you'll know is that every time you're doing, there are assumptions that are being made when you measure the characteristics. Are you measuring the right things? Are, are you, you know, so if, if, if you're reporting estimates of some characteristic in the population, is it from, is it, is there some bias sampling process that's resulting in the group that you're studying, or are you doing something that's, that's kind of in a designed way? Statisticians, one of the things that you can do is say, well, yeah, this is okay, but I, I'll give you, I, I'll give you an example that occurred even at my institution. An administrator in my institution reported that there was a certain prevalence of cases in, stu in the students, a certain COVID positive prevalence in our population. 
I looked at the data and I said, this couldn't be possible. And I sent a note to this administrator and said, the prevalence based on what the raw data that's being reported would be much higher than what you're suggesting. Can you please, can you clarify? And they ended up changing the way they reported because what they were doing was they were talking about a prevalence among students that were, that were COVID free, symptom free, not in quarantine and randomly sampled from that, that particular group, a very different number than for the whole population. So one of the things that statisticians can do is ask questions for clarification. So that's one, one thing that I would suggest. Okay, another question. How long did it take you to get your PhD? And the second one is what are you studying now, researching now? Ah, <clears throat> very good. So um, let's see. So how long did it take me? So the the university that so I, I did four years of undergraduate, which is typical in the US. We have a, a um, it's we have both liberal arts sort of breadth requirements as well as our depth requirements within our specialties. So that's something that 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 we do. Uh, in terms of the how long it took me to get my PhD, it was about four years. So I did a master's as well as a PhD. Uh, then I did a postdoc, which was a I did a placement, which was after my PhD at a research organization, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And so that was my my kind of that was my uh, path for work. In terms of research that I've been doing, uh, let's see. In I, recently, I, I well, let's see. I'll tell you what I'm working on. I I just finished a a revision to a, a book. So I saw that, you know, so I've been working on, that was something that was a major part of my life last last year. So I was doing, I've done some statistical programming work and, and talking about that. I'm working on a project now with a journalist, which is another book, book project called Statistics Behind the Headlines. And in that case, what we're doing is we're looking at when you look at a, a headline and you look at the story and then you look at the science, what are the statistical concepts that you need to understand to be able to understand the, the background story as well as then whether or not the newspaper story was reporting with integrity what, what the, the, the work suggested. I'm also collaborating with, with students um, on a couple of projects that are more risk assessment related. So it's, it's the idea of what is the exposure level that's associated with a particular um, either occupational or environmental or any kind of risk. So we're looking at some problems that are associated with model averaging. And we're doing some comparisons of model averaging methods for generating risk estimates. That's a, sorry for that, 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 that may have no meaning to some of the, some of the participants that, aren't, that don't play in this space. But it's, if you think of regression, and you say, okay, if I pick a, if I have a regression relationship and I pick a response level, and then I can say what level of the, the, the predictor variable is associated with that response increase, that's a, that is essentially some endpoint, some effective concentration or dose. Being able to, to be, to, to project that as part of what you do. So we're doing some work there. We're studying another problem that's related to uh, thinking about, are there artifactual relationships when you use smoothers and predictors? So if you're looking at a prediction model that have that has the x variables in it, and suppose instead of just the x, you have some function of those x's, can you sometimes see unusual patterns that emerge and fits? <clears throat> so, you know, I I that's I, I work on lots of different things. So I don't I can't really there's not not a single thing, but I, I bounce between it. The the probably the book with the journalist that I'm working on now is is the one that's going to be pressing the hardest because. I'm 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 almost late. I don't don't tell my don't tell my editor. I'm we're trying we're trying, but yeah. Um, John, here's a question that quite interests me from Tanner, and he says, "Will stats as a career path be taken over by technology in the future? Will you need statisticians?" <clears throat> I um, that's a that's a well. Let, let me. What do you think? You know, I could ask the group. So everybody can, you know, I, I, if we did a poll, we could do this. But how many of you think there's still a future for statisticians and data scientists? Human ones. Those with a pulse. Non-silicon based. There's one. There's one. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So let me, the, the um, I mean, it's hard to answer this and not sound like I'm, I'm, uh, 
Do you know the expression, you know, the feathering my own nest? Have you ever heard that expression? The, the, uh, the idea that answering this without, it's, it's sort of our interest is that, yes, of course, I think there is. But I do think there is because, I, I mean, a statistician is a, should be a good problem solver and a general thinker that can see patterns that, that goes beyond. So you bring tools from other, other areas to apply to them. I, I'll give you an example. A colleague of mine, this is many, many years ago, worked on a really interesting problem. And, and her, she was interested in a problem where they were looking at whether or not exposure to a certain chemical might result in, in a, um, might result in some kind of reproductive impacts. So delays in pregnancy or other outcomes. What she did was she ended up taking this, this was the data problem that she was working on with colleagues. And she framed this to say, okay, well, what's a probability model for number of cycles until successful conception? And she said, oh, that looks geometric. And then she said, well, what's, what's the kind of model that might be for probability that where that might be a function of the exposure to these, co these, these important exposures? these important variables and also might change with age because that's also potentially a confounder here and said, well, let's have a beta model for the probability. So the coupling of this representation of the probability and a model for that is with this probability model for the outcome led to an analysis. Now that type of connections and thinking, I don't see being superseded by, by other, by automated means. I do think that some routine work could be done. If you're thinking about automated generation of tables or kind of routine calculation, but I think that, you know, kind of the connections and synthesis and um, approaching problems with a level of abstraction where you can see representations and models that could be applied. I still think that there's going to be a role. I, you know, in a system, the other thing is that I don't think artificial systems are going to be able to say, does this, does this look like it makes sense for representation? I don't think an artificial system is going to say, oh, I have missing data. That's a problem. It might, it might make decisions. You know, these systems might, might automatically do imputation, but they're not going to make these decisions. So I, I feel very strongly that there will be a role for, for, uh, for us long into the future. There was a question from Tusani who raised his hand. I think he was raising his hand to say he agreed there's a future for statisticians. <laughs> um, but the question he wanted to know was the difference, is there a difference in statistics done by an actuarial scientist and a data scientist? Was it the same stats? <clears throat> you know, that's a, that's a good question. One of the things that we have in my department so we have multiple degrees, which includes a Bachelor of Science in Data Science and Statistics. And we also have a, a minor in Actuarial Science and we have other degrees. One thing that, that we have seen is that our colleagues in Actuarial Science really want to have more data science predictive modeling preparation among actuaries. So the actuaries are being asked to, to have that more expansive training as well. And I, that's particularly true for the, the actuarial scientists that are working in uh, property and not, not so much in the health and life insurance realm, but more in the property and casualty side. So there still is a, is a, a serious role and opportunity, I think. So, um, I, you know, Sally, did I go off on a tangent here or did, did I answer that question? Is there, is there more to say? Uh, it was the difference between statistics done by an actuarial scientist and a data scientist. Yeah, so let me come back to it. So, so what I've just, the question, so I did like every good professor does, I answered the question I wanted to answer first. So now let me see if I can answer the question that was asked. <laughs> is there a difference in the statistics? Uh, there, there is somewhat of a difference in that, that actuarial scientists are often doing rate making. They're trying to, they have different goals and outcomes. A data scientist may be doing some predictive modeling. There is some of that in actuarial science, particularly if you're thinking about, like I said, you know, what are the chances that you're gonna be in a wreck? How do I do, if I wanna do some of these market segmentations and doing some of it's, that looks a lot like unsupervised learning in, in other contexts. Uh, but, but actuaries also are interested in setting up the, the basically, how much should I charge for insurance for a young man who's driving? You know how you know that's versus a, a young woman. That's a, these are these are kinds of of a different type of problem. So it's a more, I would suggest it's more specialized techniques. You know, you could also ask: Is there a difference between someone who's working in clinical trials and someone who's working in epidemiology, or someone who's working in you know industrial design? Yes, they're they're going to use some different tools. But but what happens is an actual scientist has this very different uh, foundation and business core. Whereas someone who's working in data science probably has more of a computational core and background. Okay, there's one more question here that 
I don't think we've addressed. It's um, a more specific question from Navashin. And he wants to know the importance of Euler's constant in statistics, oh, as so well as its uses. Ah, so we, we want to have technical questions. So, oh man, this is this is like I, I'm being being put on the spot here as sort of a dis, you know good good defense question. Well, let me ask. So, I, where have you seen it used? Navashin, top your answer. Okay, so you see. Okay, so it's part of. So you've seen it used in terms of describing kind of the 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 kind of the the trade the um the decline from the the mode in a, a normal. So specifying a density function, it's part of that. It's it's very commonly used in statistics. It's important for everything from uh, you know moment generating functions to specifying density a variety of continuous densities. You know, it's a so I mean it's. It's, it's, it's important if you're thinking about exponential growth, it's important if you're thinking about exponential decay, it's important if you're thinking about models for, for just a lot of the models for change will often have that as some component of it. If you're interested in pharmacokinetics for people that work in a, in a biostatistical biopharmaceutical setting, you'll often see that the representation might be a sum of, uh, you might have solutions that would be sum of exponentials describing uh, concentrations and area concentration time profiles. So uh, I guess the, sh the short answer is uh, lots of places. There was a question right at the beginning about simulations. What simulations are you referring to? Well, there, there are simulations that, um, that, that will help you under, you can use them to study properties of statistics. You can also use them to study, uh, to help understand and explain what's going on. I'm going to, I, I'll, I'll paste an example of one that I thought was was very effective. There is a um, in the U.S. There's a a, a paper that's a, a newspaper that's based in in the Washington D.C. area, the and the Washington Post. And one of the things that the the off the uh, one of the data reporters there has done is is produced essentially a. a a, a visualization that is an amazing way of trying to understand what's going on with um, with the COVID the COVID problem. And so I'm gonna, with with COVID in the U.S. And, and around the world and infectivity. So I'm going to paste. This was a uh, a podcast that where where Harry this this person Harry Stevens a, appeared on it and his his simulation of outbreaks like coronavirus spread exponentially is something that's that I've just posted here and I think this is a <clears throat> truly a brilliant a brilliant example and what he's doing is he's showing how to 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 basically tell a story about what's happening in in this system and so I, I will um if if you'll allow me I'm going to I'm going to be bold enough to grab my to share my screen with you and just maybe it's easiest for me to show just the example of how this works so, so I assume Sally, you can see my screen now. Is that correct? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. So the what what you will see is that um, this is the second link that I mentioned, who's a graphics reporter, and one of the the parts that this was back in March when we were seeing it, and that's so there's for those there's an exponential curve. That's that's what has people worried. Now, obviously, things have changed a lot since then, but here's the idea where he was trying to tell a story of just a very simple story of what happens when people meet and how that changes but this is a population where he's just he's set up a very simple dis display to show what happens in a closed system where people are moving around and they're not socially distancing they're not isolating and how infections can just run rampant and you can see that this was a it's a completely pretend system it's made up it's constructed to try to illustrate a story what he shows is what happens if you do some isolation. If you can isolate the sick, then you can keep it. But what happens if you then open up that isolation? Well, then all of a sudden, you know, then it's, it's you just have delayed kind of the onset of this. These are the, the stories here. This is a case. This is where social distancing is in place. And in essence, what he told from his story is this he used a the idea of simulating a system to try to un, to try to tell a story to a larger community about what happens with with infectivity 
in populations that are open and not distancing and not masking versus ones that try to, to maintain that. And that's an example of a simulation that's used for exposition of a concept or, or to illustrate what might happen as you controlled things. The more detailed example, like I had responded earlier, was tying to the idea of studying properties of statistical methods. I mean, I suspect that, you know, th these are things that, that if, you're, if you're prototyping what might happen, you might, you might explore this. Dane, do you use any of this? Do you do any simulation as part of your work? Yeah, we do. <laughs> so um, sometimes we don't have, um, we don't have covariates or predictive variables um, beforehand. So uh, we simulate likely quantiles um, based on, on, on some parameters from, from uh, you know, the distribution we know. Um, and then we, we feed those into those effectively become our, our, our predictors to, to understand well, con and we condition it on, on we condition them. So what, how, how much money is this game likely gonna make? Um, conditioned on the, the, the cluster or type of game it was. Uh, and then we simulate the likely, um, well, the likely uptake uh, uh, of a game, um, they conditioned on the cluster, conditioned on, uh the the day so how many days it's it's it's, it's live for um yeah so we, so we use simulation quite a lot um but yeah it'd be, be kind of applied um it's a very useful tool when you when you when you don't when you don't have data or, uh, or when you want to generate likely data we we use simulation prof could i ask you one more thing that that Please. application you built is that a shiny application Oh, the, the one that the data viz site? The web app, yeah. Yeah, that's, it's a Shiny app. Do you, do, do you all play at all with Shiny in, in your space? Is this something that you use at the university or at Dane at your company? Yes, we, we use Shiny a lot. So we, um, we, we write a lot, of, uh, a lot of R and um, sometimes Python and we wrap, we wrap the Python inside R. Uh, and then all of our deployments are either uh, Shiny web applications or interactive uh, markdown documents or APRs, uh, where other, other applications consume the data that we generate. But John, we, we're a big fan of Shiny. We love it. It's super versatile. Um, very, very powerful tool to have in your, in your, in your data science toolbox. A practical question. Average salary, salary one can expect if one goes into data science. And do you think it's a career that's going to grow exponentially? You know, ex exponential means that, a bit, that there's no carrying capacity for a system. So I, but in the early phases, exponential logistic tends to look exponential. So I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll give you at, at, at least uh, logistic growth. I, I don't know that I'll give you exponential growth, but I do think that the demand for this will continue for, for quite a while. The other part is I would say that you cannot name a discipline for me that I don't think would benefit from having good science, data science foundations. You know, if you were, if you wanted to, if you're a pol interested in political science, you know, the political science, political organizations, political parties are wanting to understand their membership. You know, I, I just saw an ad from a church trying to do, uh, do analytics for their understanding their, their, their attendees. And, you know, I, th I think that, you know, if you look at, at people that are in the humanities, they're digital humanities that are trying to think about the ascertainment and assignment of authorship. I knew his, uh, history history professors that were trying to understand and trying to estimate size of populations given certain data that they might have when there's, there was inadequate data. So no matter what you do, you will benefit from this foundation. That's, that's it. So I, I think that the, uh, I, I think the future is bright. I, it, was, it was bright when I was finishing. The difference was when I was finishing, I don't know that there was as many opportunities for people to work straight out of a bachelor's degree. That's, I think, a big change. There are more opportunities, there are more jobs at all degree levels. So I think it's, 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 a, it's very bright. And just if people didn't pick up on the chat, um, Kathy Sims from Sagia said the entry level role in South Africa is about 320,000, which is a, a very happy entry level salary. I wouldn't oh, okay. sniff at that. Um, just a couple last questions. Uh, is financial modeling closely linked to statistics? Uh, you know, it's, I am, financial modeling is going to use tools from statistical modeling, but
but may have different language for it. Just like econometrics will have used tool. There are many of the tools that you find in econometrics look like statistical tools, but they call they label things somewhat differently. So the answer is, you know, kind of yes, but it's it's using the same idea of inference. There's going to be estimation. There's going to be modeling and prediction. But you're going to have to have a much stronger foundation in terms of finan financial tools and techniques and methods. Um, a quick technical question. What's the most common distribution you come across? Is it T distributions? Uh, I, I tell in my classes, I said, you know, if, if someone wakes you up in the middle of the night out of a dead sleep and said, you know, I'm going to threaten you with your life unless you can answer this question about what distribution should I use, you should always say normal. You know, when it, you know, because you're, you're likely to get it. If, if things are asymptotic, you're probably going to be okay. You know, but, but generally that's my, you know, if I were going to, if you're going to be pushed on it, there's, that's something that, you know, that would be my default, but, but you know what, again, you have to think about if, if you're, if you're building methods, if you're thinking about analysis, you have to think about what's the pro right probability model for the phenomena, the study that you're, the, the, the result that you're studying the experiment that you're investigating. What stops uh, statistics or da data science becoming a boring or repetitious career? I would say it's the opportunity to interact with colleagues like Professor North. That's, that's been, uh, you know, so, so for me, one of the great joys in my life has been able to, to, to interact with the community of scholars that are in our field. The, the, you know, the other part of that, that what we do that I think is really critical and what keeps it fresh is I'm not working on the same problems that I worked on 30 years ago. You know, I, I'm a, I enjoy applying my, the, the tools of our trade. I enjoy the use of statistics. And, you know, if you had asked me 30 years ago, would I work with gerontologists and collaborate with them? I would have said, who? And, and yet, those are some of my, my continue, I do work with aging re, people that, that do research in terms of aging populations. If you had said that you will, you'll be doing a podcast with journalists, I would have said, what? You know, that's, what are podcasts? I mean, the fact that if, if, as long as you keep yourself open to opportunities that are going to come on, and, and then you embrace problems that are outside. The other part of it is tools continue to evolve. You know, Dane, Dane mentioned R and Python and other tools that are used. When I was finishing graduate school, R did not exist. It was just, it wasn't a tool. You know, now, so the tools evolve and so you have to continue to keep learning. So for me, what, what one of the things that I love is that um, it's not repetitive because it can, you know, I'm not using the same tools in the same way with the same problems. If I, that would be awful. If, if everything I had learned decades ago, that's all I was using and I was only applying them to the same problems that I had started then, that would be a nightmare. I would, I would have left this career long ago. But the fact that I'm talking to people about data science now is, was inconceivable a decade ago. The fact that now statisticians' careers may, may be called analysts or data scientists or web analyst or what you know find the label that you like just says that there's a that there's continuing evolution and richness in the career in which we work i i feel very lucky i don't I, you know i i don't know about my colleagues here i'm i i bet you know so i could i could pick on james here and and i'd say you know you know that's there you've seen the you know you've all seen the changes i could pick on delia as well and and others that haven't you seen these I mean, isn't that part of what's kept it fresh for you is the fact that things have, have continued to change and you had to keep keep fresh with it? Yeah, um, very much that uh, one of the things that I've been involved with that the kids are going to look at later on is, is data visualization and the, the capacity for, because I, I spent most of my career as a high school teacher um, and the frustration was that there was so much data becoming available but uh, youngsters were not able to engage with it because the, the statistical techniques for working with multivariate data uh, are far too sophisticated. But if you can see it in the data visualizations, then you can tell stories and you can begin to understand the complexity of the world and understand if people give you, if people 
tell you simple answers to complicated problems, you know that it's nonsense. But also if they tell you it's too complicated for you to understand, that's not a great state of affairs either. So I moved from teaching high school into trying to, to help that sort of communication. Um, and yeah, it, 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 it always was the case that um, you couldn't work with multivariate data because there was no way for kids to work with it, but that changed with technology. So yes, I would completely agree. It has, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily kept me young, um, but it's kept me younger than it might otherwise have done. Um, John, I'm going to have to bring this to a close now because we've used up all your time. So I'm going to hand over to Delia to thank you and also to answer the final question that came in in relation to your talk was that if you get a degree here at UKZN, can you pursue an international career? Does it hold? So Delia, if you can thank John and move on with the program. We'll do that, thank you. Um, I want to thank John for giving us so much of his time and in particular for getting up so early in the morning, John. I really appreciate it. We're most honored to have you. And I think the questions became sort of seeds of comfortable conversation. And we've all enjoyed it, not just the schoolboys. We've learned a lot, I'm sure, but I certainly have. And uh, thank you. All I can say is really we appreciate it and we hope that you'll come out and do a live dudes in data with us one day in the near future. <laughs> it would and, be my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation to join you. It's been an honor and a delight. Thank you very much, John. And just to, uh, to tell all our um, boys that are present and teachers, you might wonder who James Nicholson is, the game that you're going to play later, the data game. That's uh, James is doing, so you'll get to know who James is later on. But um, really, I just want to, as I say, thank uh, John and also later James will be playing a part. And to quickly answer the question that Sally posed about, um, sorry, Sally, what was it again? It was about the, if you do a degree at UK. If, if you do a degree here, um, will it stand you in good stead if you want to work overseas? Yes, definitely. Our data science degrees are all our degrees, in fact, are internationally recognized. My own son has got a job. He only moved to Canada in March and walked straight into a job, in fact, in data science. He did the actuarial science and statistics major and immediately got a job, um, went over without a job and within a month had a very good job in Canada. So definitely no concerns there. So our next part of our program is where our academic staff, two of our staff members, will be talking to the boys about maybe giving them some um, pointers on how to be successful. And I'm going to start off, I'm going to introduce um, the academic leader, which is what you would maybe call the head of statistics at our institution, over to Professor Sean Ramroo. Thank you so much, Delia. Um, greetings to all our students this afternoon, our DVC, Prof North, Prof Baylor, uh, and all of our academic colleagues and statisticians that are present here this afternoon. Uh, I'm Sean Ramroop, as uh, Delia has mentioned, and I'm the academic leader of stats. I've been tasked with the responsibility of uh, speaking on our expectations and the reality as far as statistics is concerned, and as far as tertiary education is concerned. So basically the consequences of an ever widening gap between our expectations and reality often result in disillusionment, discouragement, and even shipwreck, especially for undergraduates or students coming in at first year. And the point of the previous session uh, where Prof. Baylor gave us such richness in all his answers was that our expectations and our reality has got to have a gap that must close. And the point of the session is to encourage students to ask, ask, ask as many questions as you can possibly ask about whatever discipline you decide that you want to get involved in, uh, particularly statistics. 
So my next slide really is just five different expectations and the reality associated with these expectations. Um, there are several expectations, but I've just decided to highlight five. The first of which is there is an expectation amongst first year students or entrance students that university is just an extension of high school. And if high school was a breeze, then university will be an even more gentle breeze. The reality of this is getting your matric or your IEB qualification, matric certificate is just a ticket to cross the bridge to university. What happens is that the playing fields are now level again, and everything depends on you. My encouragement to you this afternoon is to work as much as you can. Commit yourself and be dedicated to a lifelong learning process. Um, as long as mathematics exists, as long as technology exists, as long as problems in real life exists, there will always be an infinite need for statisticians and data scientists throughout history. Expectation number two is students often expect that math, statistics, and computer science are going to be difficult subjects. Uh, the reality is, is that all subjects can be difficult. Sociology can be difficult. Chemistry can be difficult. But if you work as hard as you possibly can, all subjects can become very, very enjoyable and simple for you. Strive to be as best as you can by working as hard as you can. Expectation number three is this here. We often find that when students complete their degrees, they only use perhaps about 15% of the subject matter that was covered at university. So there is an expectation that states amongst first year students that I will only use a small percentage of my data science or statistics material in the real world. The reality is very encouraging. Statistics, mathematics, and computer science will actually empower you to use all of the subject matter you receive from the first year. Let me go on to say, perhaps even from the first lecture in the first year. Number four, I can study a few days before an examination or test and still do extremely well. Students often call this cramming or padding. Uh, the reality of this is once you get into university, don't do this. Do not pass begin, do not collect 200 rands, go straight to jail. The answer is no. Prepare every day, work consistently, and ask as many questions as you need to ask. The final expectation that I want to cover with you this afternoon is this. When I receive my degree, I will, be, will I be employed and earn a very lucrative salary? I think this was covered in the interview with Prof. Baylor. Uh, the answer or the reality to this question is a degree particularly in scarce skills. Notice what I said, a degree particularly in scarce skills, much like statistics and data science will definitely get you the big mullah. So you're in for a very, very lucrative salary. Obviously it depends on who employs you and to what degree you are employed in terms of the contract. That's all that I need to share for now. Uh, students, I wish you all the best, productive studies, and a very prosperous future ahead of you. I want to hand over to Dr. Reishas Chifurira, and he'll continue with the rest of the program. Thank you, Reishas. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Reishas Chifurira. I'm a senior lecturer in the discipline of statistics at University of KwaZulu-Natal School of Mathematics, Statistics, and Computer Science and I'm going to share you expectations and reality. As an introduction, I would like to, first of all, look at why data science, which this one has already been covered. The main purpose of data science is to find patterns within the data. So your duty will be looking at patterns in the data and how best you can use these patterns to do some predictions 
and make informed conclusions from the data. So the goal of a data scientist is to derive conclusions from big data. And surely through these conclusions, the data scientist is then able to assist companies making smarter business decisions. So if you choose to become a data scientist, you want to deal with the data and definitely you want to assist companies making smarter business. The unemployment rate is alluded by Prof North is quite alarming at around 26.6% and currently at around 30% in South Africa. Therefore, it is worth remembering which skills will give you a competitive edge over others and that will increase your chance of landing a new job. And why at UKZN? Why choose at UKZN? Among all universities in South Africa, believe me, we are the one with five professors in statistics. We are privileged to have five senior lecturers with PhD in statistics. We are also one of the very few departments of statistics in the country with the three experienced lecturers who are almost done with their PhDs in statistics. And guys, believe me, we are not lecturers, but we are teachers and parents. We are actually teachers and parents. So if you come to us, you are not only coming to academics, but you are coming to teachers and parents. The majority of our staff have been teachers at high school. They know where you are coming from and they know where you are going. And that makes them good teachers. Let's hear some testimonies from former and current students about UKZN. Hi, my name is Kimara Nairn and I currently work as a data scientist within the banking and financial services industry. In simple terms, a data scientist is the qualified professional that helps organizations or companies create maximum value from data. Data scientists apply skills from multiple disciplines such as mathematics, statistics, and computer science to solve problems or make informed decisions that are of interest to that particular company or organization. I have completed my degrees at UKZM and graduated cum laude in both my honors and masters in statistics. My journey at UKZM has been challenging but rewarding at the same time. You should always try to pursue your studies with a lot of focus, determination and dedication. I'm extremely fortunate to have the support and guidance from the wonderful staff within the statistics department they have guided me along the way. The professors and lecturers are extremely helpful and are passionate about what they do. They always have the student's best interest at heart. Studying at UKZN can definitely open up a lot of opportunities for you and provide you with a solid foundation with the necessary skills and knowledge required to enter the world of work. Thank you. Let's share another one. Just to give my little background, I am a proud product of UKZM. I studied in UKZM from 2014, where I registered for MCM degree, majoring in applied mathematics and statistics. I started in my honors degree in statistics and my master's degree also in statistics, where I graduated this year. Of course, we are introduced to COVID 19 regulations. First, I would like to congratulate the UKZM team for launching the data science program. The data science program is not only interesting, but also one of the fast growing occupations in the whole world. I think it's vital to pay compliments to the team for their dedication in equipping students with STAR skills, which are actually required in the workplace. While I was a UK student, I benefited a lot from a team, such as a very good knowledge on how to deal with different types of data. Specifically, the modules which are provided are well informed and relevant to the place in such a way that they give a new variety of choice to 
those adults and they can assist taking cures for your aunt's facilitation. For example, if you are interested in health science data, education data, economic data, you are well equipped with the necessary uh, methodologies and techniques for each specialization. As my own specialization, I deal with financial data, of which I was equipped with well structured modules to be prepared for this kind of specialization. So again, I'd like to congratulate you guys and for launching this uh, data science program. And we are looking forward to see the growing number of data scientists in South Africa. Data science is a career for future. Thank you. Thank you. Now we then move to what are the expectations? What are the things that we expect from you guys? To achieve what these guys, these ladies have done, you need hard work. Hard work is the gateway to success. Even though we are teachers, even though we have got the heart of a parent, we expect you to be hard workers. With hard work, you can succeed. Actually, we have got a motto that it can be, it can be done. It can be, it can be done. It can be done. Your work rate must be consistent right from the beginning of the semester to the end. Actually, from the first year, we expect you to work consistently. Once you work consistently throughout the term, you will never get it wrong. Thirdly, you must remain focused. Like what one of the students has said, that once you are focused right from the beginning, if you are focused throughout, you will get it right. And we expect students who are who remain focused. They know exactly why they are here. And they remain focused and it can be done. Student must be self-efficient right from the beginning of the students, of their studies. Basically, if you are self-efficient, focused, consistent, and a hard worker, you will definitely get it right. These are the things that, these are the skills that you aim right from high school to university. There is no change. There is no change that when you are at university, you no longer work hard, you are not consistent, you, you, you are not focused. If you combine hard work, consistent and focused, and you become self-efficient and a team player, a role player in a team, you will definitely get it right. Lastly, but never the least, you need to be independent and self-motivated. Once you are independent and self-motivated, guys, you can make it. Remember, it can be done. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jeremy Bukas, and I'm a project manager with an organization called SAGIA. So SAGIA stands for the South African Graduate Employees Association. And effectively what we are is we have about 180 organizations that are members. Um, and we provide them with latest insights in terms of graduate recruitment, what are the trends that are happening both nationally as well as internationally. And I particularly work on a project called Quantify Your Future. And effectively what Quantify Your Future is, is that we were basically, well, we actually launched in March of 2019. Um, and our aim is to actually promote management, quantitative, computational and data science career paths. Um, and the reason that this project actually came about was that a lot of the organizations is specifically within financial services, so your banks, your insurance companies were saying to us that they are seeing a major challenge in terms of the number of students coming out of university with these types of degrees that can actually drain them as, as, as graduates. Um, so we formed this project and our goal is to actually support universities in terms of promoting these, these degree options about an undergrad as well as a postgrad level, and also to show what are the range of careers that you can actually do if you study these degrees. And one of the reasons that we're actually sponsoring, um, you know, the Students in Data program is, you know, we 
we want to actually show kids that, you know, if you do data science, is the world's your oyster, effectively. A lot of the other speakers have spoken about it. Um, we, I mean, one of the questions was that, will, will data science um, be obsolete, for example? I can actually tell you that there's so many opportunities for kids that are actually doing data science. Um, so we actually sponsored by a whole range of, of various banks. So we have um, a number of the banks that are sponsors, um, those being Standard Bank, APSA, Nedbank, Capitech, and a whole range of other organizations. Um, and, and so what they've decided to do is to actually pool their money together so that they could, they could then tackle this problem together. Um, and what I just want to do is actually play you a video of Muhammad Ali. Muhammad's actually an alumni of UK's Ren. Um, he did actuarial science and then did his honors in statistics. So Sally, if I could please ask you to, to play that video. My name is Muhammad Ali. I studied actuarial science at UKZN and then followed it up with a honors in statistical sciences. My role at the FNB currently is the team lead in the NAV Data and Insights team. We build uh, customer-centric models which are customer-facing and land up on the app eventually. So coming from a family of professionals, the choices was either medicine or the usual CA route. But liking challenges and uh, wanting to solve challenges led me into actuarial science. After getting my honors in statistics and getting into the working world, corporate world, understanding how big data adds value within businesses led me into my role now and actually enjoying it. Building customer-centric solutions means we need to be in touch with what's affecting customers out there. What do they want to be solved? Being proactive about that. So there's many meetings with stakeholders, with businesses, understanding what problems we need to solve. Once that's done, then the planning starts to actually see how we can use data to solve the problem. And that's when we get into the technical nitty-gritty of actually creating a model to solve that. And that's a typical day. One of the main highlights of my role is actually solving problems. Knowing that you are impacting customers' lives out there uh, really adds value and adds excitement to the role. Working in this space allows me to explore different spaces, different options, and that sparks the innovative mindset that I have. Being customer facing is also one of the challenging parts of the role because you have to be as accurate as possible and that always keeps you on your feet to make sure that your models have been covered from all angles. The data space is uh, evolving rapidly. There's big data, machine learning, AI coming in and if you don't stay with the trend, you will be left behind. There's a many courses via Udemy that, that we're currently looking at, reading up on international trends, keeping up with what's happening in the current industry will always keep you ahead of the game. So balancing work life with personal life is, is a must in any career and going home to a family where I have a little kid is, is a refreshing time that I need. Playing soccer, watching football, as well as playing games, socializing with friends keeps me uh, happy and refreshed. So these are some of the organizations that have actually sponsored Quantify Your Future. Um, so several of the banks as, as well as Sundam. Um, and what they've also done is that today, um, they've actually sponsored a couple of prizes which will be given out after the game. Um, and the people that have actually sponsored have been First Fan, Capitech, um, Standard Bank, as well as Nedbank. And what we did is that we have a dual strategy of having a high touch as well as a digital presence. So we launched, um, we launched a website, which is, um, sorry about this. Yeah, so we launched our, our website, Quantify Your Future, um, last year. And effectively what it has is that, as you see in Mohammed's video, we have about 50 videos of various graduates that are quantitative analysts, data scientists, data engineer, behavioral scientists as well. So what I would suggest that you do is that you would have all received a pamphlet um, with Quantify Your Future on it. I really recommend that you go onto the website, you know, take a look at it, register on it so that you can get the latest news, the latest events that we have. We have information on universities to apply to. Um, we basically partner with 10 universities. We have all the various funding options, you know, whether it be NAPSIS, whether it be bursaries, um, with our sponsors, scholarships with the various foundations, e.g. the Michelle Scholarship Foundation. Um, at a later stage, you guys can start looking at what are the postgraduate opportunities that are available. So, for example, at UKZ, now they've recently launched a, a um, you know, you can do your master's as well as your PhD in terms of data science. You can look at all the various work, 
work opportunities that are available from our sponsors. And we also have various blogs and newsletters that we push out each year. Okay, that's it from my side. So I hand it back over to Sally. Thanks very much. Um, no further ado. Uh, our data activity will be run by Knowledge and Javid. Hi, I'm Javed, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I'll be presenting the data game today. And I would like to say that uh, I'm a lecturer uh, at the University of KwaZulu Natal in statistics on the Westville campus. And uh, this game was uh, prepared by me and Dr. Chunyamu. And I would also like to say that uh, the game was designed and conceived by James Nicholson from the United Kingdom. Okay, so today you will be data detectives. And uh, I have typed the link here to what I would require today. Okay, you will see a link that will lead to a browser. Okay, ray9.com, do it in data. Okay. So as I said, this data activity was prepared by myself and Dr. Chinamu and designed by James Nicholson from the United Kingdom. And you will see a guy here talking about data. Okay, there's only numbers coming out of his mouth and the lips are bright, so are the eyes and one ear, okay? So these are the dudes in data. They're very happy to talk about the experiments in terms of numbers. So today's activity uh, relates to alcohol consumption in the UK among uh, children between the age of uh, 11 and 15 years old. Okay, so this data set is uh, from a reputable UK company with strong protocols, meaning that the data received or obtained are treated with extreme confidentiality and meaning that uh, it is trustworthy, okay? So as I said, for this uh, for today, the data is on alcohol consumption, of course. Uh, it, it is a problem, uh, not only in UK, but in South Africa as well. And the variables that we, we, we will be looking at here are age, gender, and year. And we will be looking at the boys and girls uh, from the age of 15 to uh, 11 to 15 years old over the years 1992 to 2016. And here you would see that between, uh, these are surveys uh, carried out in those years, in 1992, 96, up to 2016. So here we have seven surveys. And in between each, the, in between any two survey, two surveys, there is a four year gap. Okay, 92, 96, 2000, and so on. So here we have seven surveys altogether. Okay, so, what we will do today uh, are contain up here, proportion of drinking in alcohol, usual frequency of drinking, and how much did young people drink and do alcohol abuse lessons affect behavior? Okay, so this is an interface, it is quite simple. And on this interface, you will see uh, bar charts, okay, in blue, uh, rep uh, blue represent males and red represent females, okay. Again, you will see on the horizontal axis, uh, the year, the how old are these kids? Okay, from 11 year olds to 15 year olds. Okay, and an interesting feature here on this interface is what is known as the slider. Okay, you will see at the bottom here the slider. Okay, and for this screen, the slider represents year. Okay, so here we are looking at the year 1992 for the proportions of 11 to 15 year old, 15 year olds who drank alcohol in the week before the survey in the week before the survey. So you will see here, uh, there's an increase in proportion of alcohol consumption in the week before the survey, ranging from, from the 11 year olds to the 15 year olds, okay. Obviously here, what stands out is that as age increases, so does alcohol consumption. And this is for the year 1992. But we can go across the years, across the, the different surveys. And here, for example, in 1996, you will see that the heights increase, the heights of this bar chart increase slightly. 2000 decrease, some bars uh, decrease in height. And again, decrease. Again, decrease. Furthermore, and which means that uh, government policy in the UK was good in discouraging youngsters from drinking alcohol. Okay, so again, there are three variables, sex, age, and year. And we can move these variables across the screen. So for example, here, if I move sex here, you will see the 11 year old, the age, okay, in this block, okay? 
And these bar charts represent age in one block for males here and then for females, okay? And we can do the same across the number of years, okay? So here there's an increase in proportion, okay? And so on until the survey, which is, was done, here is a decrease again, as you have seen just now, until the year 2016, okay? And we can also move year here. So that sex is now on the slider. And here we have seven blocks because we have seven, seven years during which a surveys were conducted from 1992 to 2016, okay? For 11 year olds, so up to 15 year olds, okay? And now here, the button indicates male. And if I slide it across, it will indicate females, okay? So you will see uh, that uh, 11 year olds, 11 year olds, okay? The bars in green, uh, the proportion decrease over time and as well as for 12 year olds, okay? Uh, as of the year 2004, there has been a decrease in alcohol consumption among uh, 12 year olds within the female uh, gender, okay? Again, again, from 1996 onwards up to 2016, as well as for 14 year olds, there has been a decrease. Again, guys, so here we can also see that uh, the policy in UK to discourage alcohol consumption has been successful. Okay, so, all right guys, so as I said, you can move these variables around, okay? All right. Okay, so here 11 year old, so there has been a decrease in consumption from 1992 to 2016, okay? Likewise, among 12 year olds, 13 year olds, 14 and 15 year olds. Okay, but as age increases, so does alcohol consumption, okay? So here you see that the, that the highs for the bars at 12, years, at 12 years of age increase. Same at 13 years old, 14 years old, and 15 years old, okay? So there will be some questions coming, okay? So you will have to move these variables around to be able to answer the questions. Okay, so for this first step, for the proportion drinking alcohol, okay, the question is, how would you summarize the differences in proportions drinking among these groups in 1992? Uh, you may open the link in your browser, or you may ask me to do so here. Anyone who is willing to answer? Just to be okay. clear, everybody, there's no right and wrong answer. What we want to hear is your interpretation and anybody that's brave enough to uh, answer one of Java's questions will be rewarded their prizes. Um, Shiva Singh um, raised his hand. Okay, Shiva says males drink more and older children drink more. That's good. Okay. Navashan says males overall drink more than females with a general trend of alcohol consumption increasing, increasing as age increases. That's a good answer. Overall, uh, males drink more than females. Yes, that's correct, Navashan. Higher consumption of alcohol with regards to both genders. Okay, so here we are in the year, we are looking at the year 1992, okay? All right, so. Okay, for males and females. So of course, uh, that, that was the first survey and we have seven more surveys. Now, if you want to see what happened in 1996, for example, you see that the heights of these bar charts increase. Okay, and then decrease slightly, slightly again, for a quite substantial decrease, substantial decrease, and a decrease again. So over the years, uh, the policy of the government has been successful so that there are fewer, bo fewer boys and girls drinking alcohol. Okay. Now, so as you can see, it's not only for 1992. This trend applies for the other years as well, where you see, uh, except here in 2004, where we see more, uh, slightly more females drinking than males and at 15 years old. 
and also at 14 years old, as well as 13 years old is quite odd in 2004, okay? So you will see here as age increases, by the way, uh, age also is an important factor because as, you, as these kids grow older, they tend to, to consume more alcohol, okay? So over the years. All right, so again, I have shown you how uh, the bar, the height of these bars uh, change over time. But you will see here, there are seven years. So it's not uh, clear what has happened if you want to explain to someone. So let's just swap around the way the graph is displayed. Okay, so let's have gender here. So gender on the slider, okay. And here, age is fixed on the vertical axis. So you will see here from 1992, to 2016, okay, uh, there's 11 year olds. If you look again, uh, as explained earlier on, uh, they consume less alcohol over the years, as well as 12 year olds, 13 year olds, and so on. Okay, now this is among the males. We have a similar plot for the females, okay? So here as well is a decrease. Uh, it peaks in 2004, okay? And for 13 year olds, there is a decrease as well as, okay, in, for 14 year olds, uh, it drops after 2004. And 15 year olds, there's a decrease from 1996, okay? All right, so here you observe that by swapping these variables around, uh, you have a clear indication of what's happening within the data. Okay, so there's the first further question coming. Okay, so this is the question. How would you summarize the way the behavior of young people in relation to drinking alcohol has changed in the period from 1992 to 2016? Okay, as I said, you may move the variables around on the slider or horizontal axis and so on. And the answer here is overall decrease with a bigger increase in males and females, yes. Uh, males drink more consistently than females. Okay, maybe if you, if that's possible, that you can guide me through to your answer so that everyone can see. Okay, so Shiva says put the sex in the top label here. And then with yeah in the middle like this and finally age in this on the slider okay all right so this explains it so from over the years between males and females there has been a decrease okay uh, for those who are 11 year olds from 1992 to 2016. okay uh, everyone this is referred to as the slider okay uh, when you see the slide so here the slide is represents age okay all right so if you look at your answer now overall decrease with a bigger decrease in males than females okay these are for 11 year olds uh, I see males are higher Okay, in some places, males and females are almost equal. Yeah, but overall there has been a decrease, okay? Among 15 year olds from the year 1992 to 2016. Okay, thank you. Anyone else would want to comment? Okay, let's move uh, sex here. Okay, and then age on the horizontal axis. All right, and here you will see years appearing on the uh, on the on the side here. Okay, for 1992 down to up to 2016. Okay, so you will see for 11 years old for males who are males at 11 years old, 12 years old, up to 15 years old, and you will see here there has been this this graph is much clearer. Okay, so here there has been a decrease from 1992 to 2016 for 11 year olds who are males, okay, boys. And the same trend for those for 12 year olds. And there was a spike here 
1996, okay, as well as among the 14 year olds in 1996, okay. I'm not quite sure why, but yes, there has been an increase, there has been a spike in those years, okay. So these, this is among uh, males. Let's have a look among females. Let's drag this here. Okay, so you will see here that the heights decrease, okay. So that's a very good way to compare uh, the trend between males and females over the years 1992 to 2016. Okay. Okay, so as I said, you can play uh, with these variables uh, where, wherever you want to place them, okay? The idea here is to get the best graph that will explain the situation or, or the story. Now, remember that a data set tells a story. So you have to be able to interpret from the, from the most clear uh, output or screen or display. All right. Okay, so this was for the case where we have proportion drinking alcohol uh, in the week before the survey. And now let's have a look at the next tab that, refer that relates to usual frequency of drinking alcohol in the UK, okay, among uh, uh, kids in this age bracket, okay, 11 to 15 years old. All right, so you will observe here that frequency is fixed, we cannot move it, okay, and here a year. The slider represents a year, and here on the horizontal axis we have sex, okay, male and female. Okay, here I would like to, you would notice here that we do not have age, okay, because age here and gender has have been absorbed into one, okay, into one variable. So, for example, here uh, there might be a 13 year old uh, that who drinks more than a, uh, more than once in a month, but not once in a week. Okay, as well as for females here. We don't have the age, but there can be a female here who drinks occasionally, okay, represented by the green uh, bar. Okay, and of course here, you, if you add up all these percentages here, uh, you will see here 40% uh, do not drink, 28% occasional, 17 uh, more than once in a month, but less, uh, but not more than once in a week, that's 17%. And more, more than once in a week is 16%. And if you add these values, you get almost 100% uh, corrected, okay? As well as for females, all right? And this is for year 1992, okay? Of course, we can drag this over the years and you will see that the heights change, okay? Not by much, but they do change here substantially, more significantly and stays about the same, okay? So again, we can move here, here. And here on the slider, we have males and females, okay? And from for the years, for the seven years, running from 1992 to 2016. And you will see here, if you look at the blue, well, drinking more than once in a week, okay? Uh, after 1996, there has been a decline, okay? for males, okay, I'm looking at the button male, okay? And for this category, okay, more than once a month, but not more than once a week, it stays almost the same, except there's a slight drop uh, in the latter years, okay? In the latter surveys, 2012, 2016. And occasionally for males, this has remained about the same, okay? And the good news is that uh, do not drink has increased over the years. Okay, so these are for males. We can do the same for females. Okay, almost similar. Okay, all right. So here I have two comments in the chat. Okay, all right. So let's have a look at the next question. Okay, how much? the young people drink, okay? How would you summarize the way the frequency of drinking alcohol has changed the period from 1992 to 2016 for young people? Uh, Navashan uh, sent a response. Yes, uh, there has been a trend of people of both genders turning towards upstate, yes, from 1992 to 2016, okay? And another response from Shriva? Yes, yes, as you can see, I uh, can see that uh, 
uh, the answers related to society in general. Well done. Yeah, I was expecting that, okay? Because statistics or data science relate to what we see in society, okay? Or well, we can then move to the next step, okay? How much did young people drink? Okay, so here we have mean alcohol consumption for the same age group between males and females who drank in the, in the last week in the UK. Okay, so here I would like to point out that uh, we have combined the responses from proportion drinking alcohol from the first tab, because here the values, the outcomes were very small for 11 year olds, 12 year olds and 13 year olds. So we have combined these uh, responses into one group and we have called this group 11 to 13. Okay, so this represents one age group, 11 to 13, and then 14 and 15 year olds for both males and females, okay? And here, the slider represents year. Okay, again, guys, you can move. You can, uh, this, you can uh, go across the years over the surveys. We see a sharp increase, another increase, almost stable, substantial increase, decrease. So it looks like in the years 2012 and uh, 2016, the policies have paid off. Okay. All right. So this is across the years. And here, okay, males and females. You will see the seven years here, okay? 92, 96, up to 2016 for the age group 11 to 13 years old, okay? So again, here something happened here in 2008 where we see more females drinking than males on average, okay? So let's have a look at the 14 year olds. Well, okay, now it's the males. And among the 15 year olds, okay, there's a decrease, okay? But still males dominate, okay? All right, so if we want to have sex here on the slider, okay? So you will see again, uh, we have the different age groups, 11 to 13, 14 and 15, okay? Over the years, 92 to 2018, all right? Uh, there was an increase uh, from 1992 to 1996, uh, as well as from 1992 to 2008, then there was a decrease, okay? Among the 14 year, uh, among those who are 14 years old and who are male, okay? And also among 15 years old. All this increase, sharp increase and a decrease, okay? Okay, guys, so again, you go and swap things around, eh? Okay, so I feel that's better for males for the years 92 to 2016, okay? represented here by the charts in one block, okay? For this age group, another age group, and the 15 year old, 15 years old uh, males, okay? Now let's see what happens when we drag this to females. There's a decrease over the same time period, okay? So there's a decrease among the females in the same time period in uh, mean alcohol consumption, okay? So I would like to ask another question. Okay, how much did young people drink? How would you summarize the amount of alcohol young people consume across the different age groups between 1992 and 2016? And is there any difference between boys and girls? As I said, there is no, I mean, uh, there, may, there can be many uh, correct answers, eh, as Prof. North said. Okay, it depends on how you interpret the charts. Yes, so uh, if you may, as so I was saying, it would be nice to see how you arrive at the answer. Um, Shriva already uh, sent in a response. Yes, for the exception at 14 years old among the females, in that year, yeah, correct. Yeah, so the trend here is that males generally drink a bit more than females. Okay, thank you. Anyone else would want, would like to comment? Uh, as, as you can see, as I move the slider across, 
there, there is a general increase from the year 1992 uh, with certain cohorts, specifically the higher end of the being the uh, the, the 15 year uh, cohort. Uh, as it passes through with the the, with a decrease in the year 2008 and then a sudden decrease from 2008 onwards as you can see in the year 2012 with like almost flat lines for the for the 11 year age group and then a slight uh, increase and almost like a stabilization from the period 2012 to 2016 thank you okay thank you thank you that was excellent, by the way. Well done. Yes, well done. Okay, guys, so maybe one last question. How much did young people drink? Okay, so here, what is the difference? What difference does the positioning of the variables make in what you see in the data? Okay, I have asked you to comment, and the answer here is very simple. I mean, you have seen the different charts. You have seen the different layouts. What can you say? And there is an answer also from Ruhan. Yes, I see many, many uh, several good answers here. Yeah. You know, the different charts or the different layouts allow you to draw conclusions you want for the specific scenario. So it says here it gives different perceptions of the data and allows you to compare different variables directly. Well done. Okay, I have a last step to, sh to share. Okay. All right, here is uh, do alcohol abuse lessons affect behavior? Okay, so here, what's more interesting is that I have two sliders, okay? And drink, that is uh, drink at least, uh, the frequency, okay? We cannot move that one, okay? And here it says on the right-hand side, daily, twice per week, weekly, fortnightly, monthly, and occasionally. And for, here it's yes or no, if you have received a lesson, yes or no, okay? Here we are looking at the boys, okay, and who are 11 years old. And if we move this across, okay, we see the heights of these bar charts increase, okay. So those who the highest, uh, the most frequent one is occasional drinkers, okay. Among 12 year olds, 13 year olds, as you can see, it increases, the highest increases, because uh, we've seen earlier on that uh, the older one gets, the more alcohol that someone will consume, okay, up to 15 years old. And this is for boys. And let's have a look at the trend for girls. Uh, 11 year old in Greece. Well, Greece, Greece, Greece. And we can swap things around. Okay, boys and girls. Uh, frequency on the right hand side. So have you at 11 years old, uh, have you received any lesson? Yes. And let's see, 12, 13 increases, okay. Uh, the, it is quite odd because they have received lessons on alcohol, but yet the proportion, the proportions increase. For both boys and girls, uh, as age increases, okay? So here, 14, it's quite odd, okay? So new lessons, 11 years old, 12 increases, okay? So that's a trend for both boys and girls. Okay, so I have a last question for you. Okay, so this is on lessons on behavior. Okay, so do alcohol abuse lessons affect behavior? Okay, does it appear that young people's behavior in drinking alcohol is affected by whether they have had lessons about alcohol abuse in the previous year? Yes, it's quite odd, as I said just now, James. Uh, people who have had lessons drink more, correct. It decreases slightly, but in some cases, there, were, there was an increase in alcohol consumption. Quite a bit odd. Another interesting answer from Navarshan. People have received lessons on alcohol consumption. Does not affect their decision in the end to drink or not, correct? And Timothy is right. More lessons, more drinking. What teaching are they doing? Well done. 
Okay, so do alcohol abuse lessons affect behavior? So the tab that you have seen allows you to work with four variables when most of you uh, at school have worked with two, okay? Probably two in a scatter plot or a scatter, uh, a scatter graph uh, or in comparative bar charts. So here you have seen that we have four variables. So what can we see from here is that data can be explored by using many variables in different positions so that we may be able to, to make comparisons. Okay, so uh, when you have more than two variables, for example, you can visualize, it is about data visualization. So some, uh, kind of, some layouts will give you a better uh, idea of what the data set is telling you. Okay, so, and finally, uh, do you drink alcohol? Okay, my, our strong advice to you is that you sh must not consume alcohol, okay? Uh, many bright students uh, from high school come to UKZN, we will think they will do well, but in the end they do not do so well because they start bad habits. For example, drinking alcohol. And drinking alcohol has been shown to lead to uh, domestic violence, okay? And they also cause accidents on the road. So my, our strong advice to you is do not touch alcohol. Thank you so much. So that's all from me. Thank you very much, Javit. Uh, final speaker of the day before the closing remarks is Mr. Andre Zitzke. And just for uh, the information of everybody, we are the uh, data science movement at UKZN is highly sponsored by SAS Analytics Systems. And uh, we will leave it over to Mr. Andre Zitzke to tell you more about that. Over to you, Andre. Thank you, Delia. Uh, good afternoon, all. It, what a privilege to be taking part uh, in this exciting event. Uh, my name is Andre Zitzke. I work for SAS and I am the Global Academic Program Manager for Africa. The academic program uh, partners with universities to promote the study and teaching of data science uh, across the world. Um, SAS is the private la largest privately owned software company in the world. SAS has been focusing on providing data science software for more than 40 years, and we have been the only vendor in Gartner, which is an independent analyst firm, uh, the best data science software uh, in their um, anal an analysis for the past eight years. SAS started in North Carolina, North Carolina State University when four academics needed to analyze agricultural data but could not find the statistic software to do so. They wrote it all and it became so popular that the university management gave the four professors a choice. You're either academics or business people and they chose to be a business. And that is how SAS was, was founded. <clears throat> Personally, my uh, history in data science, I matriculated on a rural free, uh, free state town and we were only 23 uh, pupils in matric. I knew I wanted to stu study something sciencey, uh, but not physics, chemistry, biology, or no pure mathematics. When I studied the university prospectus, I saw statistics and computer science. Both were foreign to me, and I decided to give it a go. I just loved both of them and the combination. I finished in the end uh, doing my honors in mathematical statistics, and in my work life, both complemented the, the computer science and the statistical knowledge. They complement each other very, very well. I first started off with uh, programming and then the opportunity arose to get involved uh, in statistics and I grabbed it with both hands and never looked back. I'm out of it now, but I still keep in touch. Uh, if you love something, you cannot let it go. And I just love the developments in the fields as the statistics progress, as well as the, te the technology on <clears throat> which you utilize uh, to implement the statistics uh, progress, and also the applications, as there are so many more applications um, where statistics is being applied. I mean, previously, uh, there was some questions raised on the future of statistics, and is it going to be boring? Uh, 
my emphatic answer is there's always going to be a future, future for data scientists. And is it boring? If it's boring, it's your own fault. Really, you, you, there's so many opportunities for you not to be bored in this field. Um, and it's really up to you. And the industries in which you can apply data science, there's no industry where you cannot apply data science. So it really, it's up to you where you want to apply your data science knowledge. And <clears throat> just one example, over the past decade, the world has seen much development on various fronts, especially on the technology side. Mobile, fi mobile phones are just one example. It has developed from a phone to a gateway to all sorts of information and services. Every time you use your mobile phone, you leave an electric foot <clears throat> electronic footprint. These footprints are in the form of data that is stored somewhere in a database. Information and service providers want you to spend more time with them so that they can generate revenue from you, either directly or indirectly. Direct when you buy something from them or indirect when you click on an advertisement. <clears throat> Each time you click on an advertisement, they make some money. Each one of us has our own likes and dislikes. In order to get you to spend time with them and not somewhere else, they use your past footprint data to learn what your likes and dislikes are and customize your experience, what you see on the screen accordingly. How do they do that? By applying data science to the data. This is just one application of data science. There are many, many more. Helping diagnose cancer more accurately or much earlier than, than before. Understanding global warming, fighting human trafficking, creating chatbots and many, many more. Being able to use data science gives you the opportunity to make a big impact, helping the, to make the world a better place for all. <clears throat> This knowledge opened doors for you, other doors as well. <clears throat> if you are planning a manage mode, management role later in your career, which usually happens with data scientists, research have shown that organizations with a diverse gender and racial composition in top level management are much more profitable than those who are not. There is a 36% 30, better performance of the companies that do have a diverse composition. You have opportunities ahead of you that you even don't know about. Neither do I or any of us that's on this call today. <clears throat> and this event aims to make you aware of some of them. And this is what we have to thank Prof. Delia North and her team at UKZN and the support from UKZN for organizing this event. We at SAS see this as an opportunity to make a difference in young boys' lives and will continue, continue to support this event in the future. If you are still writing exams, I wish you all the best for what lies ahead uh, for this year, for next year. Work hard, do your best, and I hope to see you at UKZN in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Zitzke, and uh, we really appreciate your contribution to this uh, great course that we're trying to do. And now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you um, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science, uh, Professor Albert Modi. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. It's, uh, it's late in the afternoon. Um, when I asked John what time it was, he said it was early in the morning. Let me start off by thanking you very much, um, all of you, for uh, being part of this important uh, um, uh, event. It is an event. I see people coming from all over the place. Of course, we are targeting young people, but I'm very happy uh, that uh, there are many people with experience who decided to join us. Um, as the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science in our efforts to um, uh, showcase our um, ability to change lives through uh, data science in the School of uh, Math, Stats and Computer Sciences. I see many young people uh, joining with their parents. Uh, you can see here that somebody 
is using the father or the uh, mother to assist them uh, with technology to join. I, I thank the speakers who agreed to the invitation by Professor North um, to, to share the experience um, of their own lives, as well as uh, uh, remind people about what uh, UKZN can do to assist other people. Many of the speakers are the products of the University of Barcelona Natal. Um, so that was quite exciting to us as leadership uh, to see that. Um, I'm not going to repeat what other people have said, um, but I just want to highlight uh, one thing. Um, and uh, that is that uh, when you are in meetings like this, um, it is important to take notes. And if you note one important thing and you use it uh, to make a decision about your future, that is more than enough. But I noted a lot of things and I always refer to those things um, in my notes as keywords or highlights. You've heard people advising uh, young people here, you young folks, about uh, what is in it if you decide to take uh, um, a data science as a, as a future career. They highlighted the importance of uh, making sure that you choose a career that is going to give you opportunities in life. To me, opportunities was a key word. Uh, they indicated that uh, there's a demand. Uh, it doesn't matter which field you go to. You can go to medical sciences. You can go to agricultural sciences. You can go to mining. You can go to anything. There will always be a need for somebody with your qualifications if you choose this, uh, the, the, this career. Um, they highlighted versatility. Uh, you, you, you can change your mind in terms of where you want to focus. You can be operate operating uh, in one field and also operating in another. Um, and as you do that, you are growing because data science is actually an evolving um, kind of uh, area of study and, and area of research. So as a research led university, we are quite excited that uh, Professor North has decided to push harder and harder uh, for people to realize the importance of data science. So yes, um, you are on the verge of joining a university. All of you are going to pass metric. Um, it's, it, it's not a blessing, it's not a wish, you know it's gonna happen. Uh, when I watched you participate in this meeting, I knew that it's gonna happen. You are very lucky that uh, this meeting focused on examples uh, of the real issues that are facing humanity and we need solutions. The world needs solutions please raise your hand and say, I'm going to be part of uh, the solutions of the world. I'm going to be a person who gets a career as a result of qualifying, having studied at the University of Guazulu Natal. And I'm going to provide solutions to the global problems of climate change, the global pandemic of COVID-19, and many, many, many other problems that are causing us human beings to not be equal because we've not found solutions to those problems. And a few individuals who've got access to solutions are different from the majority of individuals do not have access to those solutions. You will join the world um, of people who bring solutions if you choose this career, and you will be thanked for making um, the world better. But today you were part of history continue to be a part of history, change the world, and you will be remembered. Choose UKZN. We are, are here, we are going to welcome you. You will have a wonderful time in this university. And I wish you all the best and thank everyone who organized uh, this meeting, particularly Sally with your team and uh, colleagues from the, from the School of Math, Stats and Computer Sciences. And I also want to thank your teachers and uh, would like uh, you to continue to listen to them when they encourage you to choose the right career in your lives. So our colleagues, thank you very much. Have a good um, uh, weekend and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Prof Modi. We've now come to the end of our program.
for those of you, I'm sure you don't know who Prof Modi is, he leads the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science. And it's largely because of his support of the data science movement that we have uh, managed to launch the postgraduate diplo um, diploma in data science and the new masters in data science, which starts next year. So there's a lot going on in the data science uh, area at UKZN. So thank you, Albert, for all the support you give us. But in particular, I want to thank each and every speaker for um, gracing us with your presence, for every teacher, every learner that came today. It's been a long afternoon. It's been a difficult year. I know you've got a lot on your mind, but thank you for being here. And I can assure you that if you take what you've heard today to your heart, you will not be doing the wrong thing if you go to you if you study data science wherever you study and if you do study data science at ukzn we really look forward to seeing you in 2022 so please do fill in the short poll it's anonymous it's just one or two questions just so that we can give feedback so that we can improve on our delivery of this program which we will do forever going forward in many different ways. You've now seen the um, emblem we use for dudes and data. Maybe next year you get invited for a dudes and data in a totally different event. When you see that little boy in blue, you know what it's about. Good luck for your exams, particularly for your grade 12 year. We hope to see you in future.